Here is a Zenith 19 inch color TV manufactured June 1988. This is really not my era of, of TV collecting, but this was in with a bunch of stuff I obtained. Well, at least it does have a wood grain plastic case. It has that going for it. And besides being dirty, it's in fairly decent cosmetic shape, except for all this mess on top where it looks like somebody had their name or something engraved in it and tried to scratch it out. I don't know what that's all about, but anyway, probably won't be keeping this set. I'll fix it up and let my friend who sells stuff see if he can get a few dollars out of it. Now we'll turn it on and I'll demonstrate the problem that it has. And see this still has the green LED readout. As you can see it has a decent color picture but the vertical, the picture is stretched out. And since the tube appears to be in decent shape, we'll give this a shot. So let's open it up and see what we've got on the inside. Oh no. What are you going to do? And here's the back of the TV. Nothing fancy. Just an RF coax input. And there's the model tag. Manufactured June 1988. Now let's get the back off. Okay, here's the inside of the set. Uh, fairly clean inside. We have the main circuit board plus the CRT driver board that's actually part of the main circuit board. Which brings up an interesting point. Uh, when solid state color TVs first appeared, many manufacturers started using modular designs as in each circuit was on an individual plug-in circuit board so when something happened you could just replace the defective module and be back in business. Well Zenith did that along with several other manufacturers. Well by the early 1980s most manufacturers had gotten away from the modular concept and went to a single board chassis which meant you could no longer just replace the defective module, you actually had to repair the circuit board to the component level. Well, Zenith was one of the few manufacturers that kept the modular concept. Even into the era of single board construction, such as this TV, Zenith actually offered this whole chassis as a replaceable module. I remember back in the mid-90s I could get this whole chassis for around 50 bucks with exchange of the old board, but which that was sometimes economical back in those days. But I always tried to repair these to the component level and that's what we're going to do today. So first we'll remove this module, if you will, and see what the problem is. And in order to remove this chassis, we have to remove a quarter inch bolt from here, 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 and here. And there should be a Phillips head screw behind the control door that has to be removed. And then the chassis should just slide out the back. And here's the Phillips screw. It's located behind the auxiliary control door that must be removed. Okay, we now have the chassis out. And the area we want to look in is the vertical deflection circuit, which is this IC mounted on this heat sink and the associated capacitors. If memory serves me correctly, this capacitor right here was failure prone. And I believe this was also the first series of Zenith TVs to have everything on one chassis. In the older days, you had separate, separate modules that could be replace like power supply, video output, IF, etc. And it was also the last Zenith that I recall to use the standard green LED channel readout. Everything after this model was all on screen display. 
and it was also the first series of Zeniths to use the a switching power supply based on an STR53041 switching regulator IC, this animal here. They actually used this same basic power supply design up until the early 2000s when Zenith became a became an obsolete brand or a gold star brand or whatever. In fact, starting in the early 90s on up, the CRTs and Zenith televisions were not that great and they were bad about shorting out and blowing out the power supply IC as well as other components. But these in the late 80s, they were still fairly decent. They weren't great, but they were much better than what was to come in a few years. Okay, I think we're back in business now. I actually found three capacitors that were questionable. Uh, one was a 100 microfarad cap that still checked okay, but it it's the one that has a high failure rate. And it looked like it was trying to blow a little bit, so I went ahead and replaced it. There was a 470 microfarad cap that checked about 420, and I replaced that. But I think the real troublemaker was a 22 microfarad cap that, that checked about 15 microfarad. And here's the picture, complete with all the digital artifacts. You can see the picture is not stretched out now. And I have the speakers disconnected. That's the reason there's no audio. Okay, so not bad at all. If we can get a signal to come in here. Just really got to love this digital crap. In the old days, you could get a snowy picture that was usable. Now it's all or nothing. All right, so I have a lot of here. Okay, here's an infomercial or something. Uh, <laughs> advertising a flat screen TVs apparently. Like Trying to convince people the wonders of these new televisions. So as far as I'm concerned, this old Zenith has about as good a picture as I would ever want to see on any television. So why would I need to buy a new Chinese flat screen TV that will be garbage in two years? I mean, this set's, what, 26 years old and still going. Okay, so actually this is an antenna commercial, not a TV commercial. Well, don't be fooled by digital antennas. There's no such thing as a digital antenna. This antenna will work just as well for digital as it did with analog. Okay, before I reinstall the back, let me point out a couple more things. I also checked two capacitors in the power supply that have a history of failure. Uh, the symptoms are either a dead or intermittent power supply, or one in which the uh, regulator IC self-destructs. This 22 microfarad cap was still okay, so I left it alone. But this 100 microfarad cap here, it, was weak. It was down to about 80 microfarad, so I decided to go ahead and replace it. And you might ask, why am I, why am I going to all this trouble to do preventative maintenance on an 80s TV that I'd be lucky to get $20 out of at the flea market? Well, I'll tell you why. These clowns around here, they'll buy a TV for 10 or 15 or $20, and then whenever it breaks in three weeks. They'll be back on my friend, like white on rice. I have a friend who sells these things for me because I don't have the patience to deal with people. He has a yard sale, flea market type thing every week. So, And he said more than once, people have brought TVs back three or four weeks later that they paid hardly nothing for, pitching a fit because they didn't work. And he said it's just easier to give them their money back than to have them make a scene. So... I'm trying to prevent this one from coming back, and I really don't think this one will be a problem to anybody. Okay, here we are back together, ready for a new home. I'll probably let my flea market friend take this up the road and try to sell it. Maybe he can get 20 or 25 bucks out of it. 
he seems to be about the only one that can sell TVs anymore like this. Uh, there's several Facebook buy and sell pages around town, but you can usually forget about those because most of the people on those pages are your 18 to 30 year old crowd who could give a who couldn't give a rat's behind about a TV like this. About all you see on those pages is particle board furniture and baby clothes, and you know when a flat screen TV or something does show up on there, they attack it like a dog attacking a bone. But you put a TV up there like this, and they act like it doesn't even exist. And I do remember a time when I could have gotten a hundred dollars for this set without any problem. But like I said, now we'll be doing good to get twenty or twenty-five out of it. But still, that's 20 or 25 more than I had to start with, so we'll just see what happens. And if it don't sell, I'll have a spare TV for my arsenal over here. Okay, there you go. Thanks for watching. And more to come later. You whispered it so softly. <laughs> okay, I'll say one more thing about this antenna commercial. In a way, I'm glad that they're making people aware that you can receive signals with an antenna so they don't have to pay outrageous prices to the cable and satellite companies. But at the same time, you don't have to go out and spend big bucks on an antenna just to receive television. Just a standard antenna will do just fine. And if you live a fair distance away from a transmitter, you might have to get an outdoor antenna. But, you know, don't pay a ridiculous price for some indoor so-called digital antenna. Okay, that's it.